Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and we've got a bunch of stuff to talk about today including the woes of a small business owner. I'm going to gripe a little bit and I'll let you know some of the other things I have to do to keep the uh, lights on in this place. Uh, the Nintendo ROM suit that you may have heard about settles for $12 million against the website. We'll talk more about that. Cryptocurrency is declining and that is hitting Nvidia shares and the good news at least is that there are GPUs available once again. We're going to discuss the potential of a diskless Xbox that will only accept content digitally. I uh, will talk a little bit more about Plex servers and what makes the best Plex server. I've been getting a lot of questions about that lately, so we'll tackle that uh, in this edition of the wrap-up. Apple takes down Twit's coverage of their most recent press conference, and we'll talk about why Apple can do that. And lastly, Alexa recordings and search warrants. Uh, is your Alexa always listening, and what is in uh, basically the realm of what law enforcement can take? So we're going to explore that topic as well. Let's get to it. Now, I want to begin, as we always do, by thanking our newest members on the channel. We've got two new Patreon supporters, Castro and Clemen Legister. And we also had a super chat that I missed from about two weeks ago, Pixel. So I want to thank Pixel for their contribution. I didn't mention them on the wrap-up that followed that live stream. And we also have a new member, Bill Miller, from the YouTube membership program there. So I want to thank Bill for joining as well. There are lots of different ways to help the channel, and I appreciate everyone who does and everyone who watches on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, we don't have an advertiser this week, but we do have a non-ad, an affiliate link for one of my favorite services, audible.com. I have been a member, I think, for almost 10 years now, and I read a lot more than I ever have because the books are read to you uh, in audio form with great narrators. Some of the fiction books actually come kind of read like radio plays. They're really entertaining and a bit of an enhancement over uh, just what you might get in print. And what's nice about Audible is that I can read books when I am too busy to actually sit down and read a book. And lately, whenever I do try to sit down and read a book, I get through like two pages and fall asleep. It's one of the uh, things that happens when you've got two young kids in the house. So this has been a great way to keep up on my reading. I love reading nonfiction books on Audible. It's a great way to uh, get that information uh, ingested, at least for me. And if you haven't tried audiobooks before, you should give it a shot. You can get a free trial at the link you see on screen. You'll get a free book and you can keep the book even if you don't go through with the rest of the Audible account moving forward. But it's definitely worth checking out. I've read a ton of books on it and will probably read many more throughout the course of the year. So let's take a look now at the Week in Review. On the Extras channel, we unboxed that Latte Panda single board computer that I reviewed on the main channel Sunday morning. You can see it up there on the main channel videos. You can find all these, by the way, in the master playlist down below. Uh, we also looked at the new MacBook Air 2018. I wasn't planning on reviewing it, but my father got one. Uh, he had a really old MacBook 12-inch uh, or 11-inch uh, device that he was using for a desktop, essentially, in one of his offices, and it was dead, and he was going to go in to get it repaired, and they told him it was a four-hour wait to get the thing uh, looked at, but he could get a new one right away. So guess what? Apple's service at work once again. So it was good for us, though, because we were able to uh, take a look at that device. And I was kind of disappointed by it because what I was expecting out of a device that called itself a MacBook Air uh, was maybe a larger version of their thin and light MacBook 12 inch, which I think is a great computer. It's actually a very good iPad alternative. I use this all the time when I travel. And really, they made a MacBook Air that was not a lot different than the MacBook Pro in size and weight. And it's not all that less expensive either. So I recommended in that video to really take a look at. Uh, the entry-level MacBook Pro because it is a much more powerful computer with a better processor. Uh, you can see more in that full review uh, link down in the video description. And we also had a fun little project involving USB Type-C power delivery. Uh, I've been working on a consulting project for Kensington. I've been doing product overview videos for many of their accessory items. Uh, they make docks, but they also make a lot of other things too, like mice and keyboards and that sort of thing. Uh, in fact, the uh, trackball that you see back there for my Apple IIGS and Mac was a Kensington product that I bought probably back in 1988 or so, 30 years ago. It still works. They make some good stuff. Uh, but we were doing a, a thing on one of their USB-C docks that they're targeting to Mac users. And I really wanted to get a sense as to what happens to a MacBook Pro 15 if you have it running off of a 60-watt dock. And it turns out uh, it looks like it just doesn't charge the battery all that fast or at all if the computer gets under load. And I was using this little uh, dongle that I picked up to kind of measure the power. They're not the most accurate power measurements, but it give, gives me a good idea as to 
uh, what's flowing through and it allowed us to compare the MacBook's power adapter versus the dock. And we also had some software running on the Mac to give us an indicator as to what the battery was getting too. So kind of a fun way to just to look and see uh, how all this USB-C stuff works. So it's kind of cool now we're getting into an era where uh, you can have a single power adapter that works across different computers and different brands of computers but the wattages uh, will be different depending on what that power supply has. But it looks like manufacturers have anticipated that and will adjust their computer's power intake to whatever is plugged into it. And that was one of the uh, missions of that particular video. And you can see it linked down below in the master playlist. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind. And this is week 91 of me doing this as a full-time occupation where I like to talk about some of the trials and tribulations of running a small business. This is a very small business with one part-time employee over there and me. Uh, and uh, you have to get insurance when you've got a business and you've got a lot of paperwork and other things you have to do when you run a business. And uh, the insurance stuff can sometimes get to be a real pain in the you know what, uh, but you want to have it there in case something happens. So I've got uh, two policies basically. I've got a pretty extensive liability policy that covers not only just general insurance liability here in the studio, uh, but it also covers slander and libel so that if I ever get sued by anybody uh, because they didn't like what I said about their company, I've got a ton of protection that I pay quite a bit of money to get every year, but I'm, I, I need it because uh, you've seen a lot of people who get threatened with a lawsuit and shut down or go into debt trying to defend themselves. I pay a lot, but I have that coverage that would uh, hopefully cover me if all that happened. It even covers any copyright claims that are made against me that go to court. So I have uh, some really good protection there. Uh, the other policy that I have is a workers' compensation policy, and this covers the people that work here. Uh, so we have one part-time employee throughout most of the year, uh, and then a college uh, friend of mine who comes in to do some work in the summer and fall uh, when he's off from school, and that's it. Not very complicated, but my workers' compensation policy uh, from Liberty Mutual Insurance has been an absolute nightmare and sucking a lot of time out of my week. I've been uh, going back and forth with them now for two and a half months uh, trying to prove to them that I only have a single 20 hour a week employee throughout most of the year. I've given them all the documentation they could ask for uh, and then they never get back to me and then they shut my policy down in the middle of the week, almost shut down uh, half of our operation here as a result. Uh, thankfully I got everything back up and, and running again because apparently, and they didn't tell me this, uh, but apparently I submitted my payroll information in Excel and they wanted it in PDF. This is how ridiculous some of these companies can be. So this is a nightmare and it's just crazy that these tiny little businesses like mine have to go through this all the time and these companies treat you like crap. So just be warned, do not use Liberty Mutual Insurance if you are a small business, you will regret it. I, I can give you more information, maybe I'll write up something to give you the whole lowdown as to what happened with this. And now it's time for some things in the news that caught my eye and this was a story you might have heard about already. Uh, Nintendo had sued a number of pirate ROM sites, including some very popular ones like Love ROMs and Love Retro, uh, for a lot of money. And it kind of surprised the emulation community because companies typically haven't been all that aggressive about uh, enforcing their rights on old uh, video game ROMs. For the most part, a lot of these companies sell these games in emulation on major platforms, and I don't think they've seen uh, the retro emulation ROM scene as a big threat to their business. But Nintendo has, and they're within their rights uh, to go out and take action against these sites, and that is exactly what they did. Uh, this Torrent Freak article here correctly uh, puts wins in a quotation mark here because Nintendo didn't win the lawsuit, they settled it, partly because the evidence against the site operators was so strong that there was infringing uh, activity going on here that they were much better off settling versus actually going to court. It cost Nintendo less money to pursue the case, and I'm sure the operators of the website are happy just to get this over with, although it looks like they will be likely turning over everything they own to the big N. Uh, how much they collect, I think, might be something we'll never know, but it's a pretty big uh, settlement. And what's interesting about how copyright law works is that if you are a copyright holder, uh, you can actually decide, uh, instead of going to court, uh, to collect from a settlement, and the settlement numbers are actually less from on the maximum per incident at $30,000 versus going through what a court might award in damages. So you're cap as an infringer is 30 grand if you decide to sit down and negotiate. 
uh, or if you take it to court, you could be fined 150 grand per incident. So if they had you know, several hundred ROMs up there, you could make the argument that each of those ROMs is an incident in of itself. You could even argue that every download is a separate incident. So you could see uh, how much the potential damages could be. So settling for $12 million here uh, certainly, I think, was probably the smarter move for the Love ROMs people just because uh, they could be into it for a considerable amount of money. Uh, and Nintendo cur clearly had the upper hand in this, and it looks like everybody just wanted to get this settled. I think Nintendo wanted to send a message, and I don't think you're going to be seeing any more ROM sites pop up online that will be doing what those sites did. And they probably made a lot of money distributing those ROMs. You know, with the amount of traffic they got, uh, the amount of online advertising that they had on the site probably generated a good amount of money. So this wasn't like they were just doing this as a public service. This was something that uh, was making them money with somebody else's material. And again, it's up to the copyright holders to decide whether or not to take action, and Nintendo did. Now, if you recall a few months ago, you could not get a GPU at market price given how many crypto miners were gobbling up all of the available inventory. Uh, well, now it looks like the opposite problem is occurring. NVIDIA uh, is under fire right now because they have about $57 million in excess inventory uh, due to the decline of the crypto market, and it's taken a hit on NVIDIA stock. Look at this cliff they jumped off uh, last week. So it uh, might be a good time to pick up NVIDIA stock. I think it's going to keep declining for a little bit until this inventory is gone. It doesn't seem like all that much, $57 million for a company of their size, but I suspect what's happening here is that the market's going to be saturated with product, both new stuff but also uh, more affordable used GPUs. And because GPUs tend to have a pretty long lifespan in the marketplace, uh, you might probably pick up a used one from a former crypto miner for a good price, and that might impact their ability to get rid of some of this inventory. So uh, crazy stuff going on with the crypto market, but what happens when you bet on something as unpredictable as that is that sometimes you lose, and apparently NVIDIA uh, is losing here. It was funny because I thought the shortage indicated that they weren't making enough inventory, but apparently they had been reacting to it and producing more. Uh, and now they've got some extra units out there, which hopefully will benefit all of us, uh, just not them at the moment. Another neat story I found was from Therat's uh, website here about the Xbox going diskless. They're going to build, perhaps next year, a diskless Xbox One that will sell for less money. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. And I think they're also indicating that there might be a disk to digital program where if you've got uh, physical disks, you might be able to convert them to the digital version, maybe for an upcharge or something. Uh, we saw that with Voodoo and some of the movies that you can get on DVD. You can actually upgrade them for five bucks to an HD streaming version. We did a video on that, and it looks like Microsoft might be doing something similar with the Xbox. And now it's time for a Q&A from you, the viewers. And I got this question in on my Facebook group the other day, but I've been getting more and more of these questions from folks who are uh, setting up their Plex servers. And a lot of folks are buying uh, NVIDIA Shields and looking at maybe having the Shield be their Plex server. And we did a video on this a while ago. It does work. I've run Plex servers on Shields before. The Pro is probably better just because it has the internal hard drive, but you can also uh, run it on any NVIDIA Shield and plug in some external storage to it. But I found more often than not that if you are doing more on your shield and perhaps having more people connecting to your Plex server, you start to kind of hit the upper limit of what the device is capable of. It has a limited amount of RAM. Uh, it's doing other things like running all of your Android apps and everything else. And if you're doing a couple of transcoding sessions and trying to watch something on it at the same time, uh, you might start hitting the limit as to what the Shield can do and everyone's performance might take a hit as a result of it. And I get a lot of questions over and over again about little glitches that might pop up here or there on the Shield that uh, make it not so great of an experience all the time, especially if you're really trying to serve media to more than just yourself on that particular device. Now, I wanted to talk about what I have for Aplex server uh, and then give you some other ideas to look at as well. Uh, I've got this WD MyCloud PR2100. It's been driving my media serving here in the house uh, for probably the last two years now. Uh, so all of my Blu-ray movies are on this. It's also my HD Home Run DVR server, uh, and it's my Plex server. And I've had evenings where I was watching a Blu-ray uh, you know, 4K movie uh, upstairs in my home theater room. My wife was streaming one of her Hallmark Christmas movies or something off of the thing on the uh, HD Home Run uh, DVR server there. And um, it was also recording stuff onto the DVR all at the same time, and it was able to keep up with everything. And uh, it's been a very good box for media. And I've kind of made this 
just media. So I have a Synology drive I use for file storage and uh, some basic server tasks. This thing is the media server and it's been fine. In fact, it didn't even upgrade the RAM on it. It's got whatever the default uh, RAM is, which I think is either two or four gigabytes of RAM. Works great and it's been a great solution, but it can be costly because I think they can run uh, into the six or seven hundred dollar territory. Uh, another video, which I'll put down below in the master playlist, um, will give you some ideas for something a little more affordable. And what we did on the channel about, a, about eight months ago or so uh, is we got one of the Gemini Lake NUX. This is their Silver J5005 base machine. I'll put a link to that video so you can find exactly which one we used in there so you can get the right one. Uh, those cost about 180 bucks. They're a bare bones kit. You do have to get RAM and of course storage to plug into it. Uh, but it is actually able to work just as well as my NAS box does. In fact, this, the processor is, is a kind of a new version of what the NAS box is already running with. And we were able to get hardware transcoding as on the Plex server side running in Linux. So you didn't even need uh, a license for Windows to get it up and running. And it was, worked out really well. We were doing three simultaneous streams and we still had a lot of room to spare on that. Uh, and that might be the way to go. Uh, another option is to use whatever computers you already have in the house. And even some older computers that you're not using anymore, like old laptops or something like that, may actually be really good for media serving. Uh, for many years, I had an old laptop that was acting as my server and it worked just fine. Uh, there is a great uh, guide here for knowing whether or not your computer will work as a transcoding Plex server at the link you see on screen. Uh, this link will take you to Intel's uh, product specification page, and I have it searching for Quick Sync Video. That is what makes hardware Plex transcoding work or not. If your processor has Quick Sync support, it will work very well as a Plex server. If it doesn't, it won't. And uh, that is really the bottom line here. If you have to do a lot of hardware transcoding to get video onto your phones or whatever, uh, having that quick sync support is going to make the difference between a Plex server that works and one that does not. So check out what your uh, NAS box has or your laptop or your desktop, whatever it is. Go to this website and see if that chip is on the list. If it is, I think you'll have a very good Plex serving experience. And I've had a bunch of requests to do more on this topic as a full-blown video. Uh, so let me know what you'd like to see covered down in the comments below. And it is on the radar screen to get done at some point. Uh, for our regular Plex sponsored video here on the channel. And I got this question in from a viewer named Darnell, and he pointed me to a video on Leo Laporte's Twit podcast network. They cover a lot of technology stuff. Uh, Leo was on the old tech TV on cable back in the day and started his own podcast network in 2004. I've been a listener of his on the podcast since he started it. And he's got a bunch of shows on the network, and one of them uh, involves uh, Macs. They call it Mac Break Weekly. And every time uh, Apple does a big press conference, Leo brings in a lot of the folks that he has on Mac Break with him to cover the press conference live. They basically rebroadcast the conference on Twit. Uh, they cut away from it and comment and then cut back. Uh, they kind of cover it like a breaking news event. They've been doing this for a long time. They've never had an issue before. Uh, but this year, with the uh, recent Apple press conference that they did in October announcing the new iPad and the MacBook Air and everything, uh, they got a copyright strike, basically a DMCA takedown, on their live stream, uh, not from Apple directly, but from a law firm that was hired by Apple to protect their IP. I don't know where it's gone since then. I think they might have to be living with this copyright strike until it goes away. Uh, but it's troubling to some degree, although it was maybe perhaps avoidable because Apple does make it very clear on the video uh, before it starts that this is the sole property of Apple. It's their broadcast and they are prohibiting people from making a copy, modifying it, or rebroadcasting or re-encoding it without the prior written permission from Apple Public Relations except as may be permitted by law. So they're carving out uh, to some degree, perhaps a fair use here, but the law hasn't really been tested as to what fair use means when you're covering a 90 minute long press conference. You can clearly make an argument if I was doing it as a news segment on this show, where maybe we pull out a small clip and talk about it and that's it. Uh, but to actually cover the event and switch back and forth uh, might be a little more difficult. It's not fair to Leo just because he's been doing it for so long, but clearly Apple has uh, stipulated here what they want to do moving forward and now it looks like they're enforcing it. And I think to some degree the reason why Apple might be getting more aggressive uh, is that it is often uh, the case where sometimes algorithms will put a live stream in front of viewers, whether it's on YouTube or on Facebook, and people might assume that that is the official stream. 
uh, when in fact it is not. And I'll give you a great example of something we did on this channel. Uh, we covered the Falcon Heavy launch a few months ago, uh, and I took SpaceX's stream and I broadcast it through my TriCaster here, live streamed it, and we did some commentary and we had a great back and forth with the viewers and whatnot. And the YouTube algorithm was putting this video in front of people uh, who were not following the channel. So they were coming into this, seeing the SpaceX video going, even though I think I put some of my own branding on it. Uh, they were getting confused as to whether or not I was actually with SpaceX. In fact, at one point, uh, people had done some super chats, and I remembered somebody writing in on the chat, why are these people paying for this? I don't understand what's going on here. And clearly, I created some confusion in the marketplace with that uh, particular stream. Uh, NASA live streams, you can do this with because they are public domain, of course. They really can't control it. But it looks like Apple is maybe seeing this happening and wants to make sure that they uh, kind of control the stream and decide uh, who can cover it in the way that they can uh, protect their brand here, perhaps. But the problem that you run into with this is that it creates the potential for them to pick and choose who can cover the event. And I think that has a lot of issues that uh, could come with it as well. So what I might try to do for the next Apple event is maybe I will write to Apple Public Relations and see if they give me permission to cover their stream as a rebroadcast with my commentary. And let's see what they say. My, uh, my gut is that they probably won't respond to my email at all. Uh, or they might just deny me outright. But I'm just curious to see what would happen if a small-time YouTuber like myself asked the big A uh, for permission to cover their stream and what happens. Let's try that when it happens next. And this next question comes in from Mark Fain from the Facebook group in regards to Amazon Echo devices. Uh, there's a murder case, and we've seen this happen from time to time, uh, where the prosecutors and the police believe that the Echo device that they had in the house at the time of the murder heard the entire thing take place and recorded it, and they want the recordings from Amazon, and a judge has ordered Amazon to turn it over. Uh, Mark here is wondering, is this just more misinformation uh, versus what is actually happening inside of these devices? And we had a bit of a discussion about this on the Facebook group. And the reality, of course, is that these devices, to the best of anyone's knowledge, are not recording until the trigger word is uttered. After that, it does, in fact, record for a short time until it hears the command, and then it stores the recording on Amazon servers. So I suspect here is that Amazon will comply with the request and it likely won't have anything unless somebody shouted out, hey, you know what, I'm being murdered, here's who's doing it. Uh, if that happened, then certainly that recording would be uh, up on the Amazon cloud, but more than likely it doesn't have anything. I think by now, if these devices were listening to us and transmitting the ambient voices, as they said in the article, uh, to the mothership, we would hear about security researchers discovering that data being transmitted, either from our phones or from uh, these Echo devices. I don't think they have to do that at all to gain some ideas as to what uh, we want as consumers. In fact, your behavior online and what you search for is far more valuable and a far greater insight into who you are versus what you might say to other people. Because what you do on your computer, uh, whether it's search or clicking on different websites or whatever, is what you're thinking. And that is far more valuable to marketers, what you're thinking versus what you say. And by extension, it's actually a lot easier to collect what you're thinking versus what you say because it requires a lot less data to get. And I always hear from friends who are uh, not always the most tech savvy, who are convinced these devices are listening to them and they'll see ads suddenly pop up in regards to something that they were saying to somebody else. I don't think it's happening. I think it's far more efficient to get what's in your head out than it is to listen to stuff, send audio back to some other place and have it search for that. I could be wrong. Some people on YouTube claim it happens, but I don't, I don't see it. I think your thoughts are, again, far more valuable and far more easy to collect. Now, Amazon, though, does issue a transparency report twice a year about the number of subpoenas and search warrants that they've received across all of their products. And I believe this list includes Amazon S3 as well. Uh, so you can see here they have received about 1,700 subpoenas, which are probably uh, things that might involve criminal or civil cases. Uh, they e either give a partial response or no response to a majority of them, but they have provided a full response in many cases to folks. Um, they've responded to a, a majority of search warrants, it appears, probably because there's certainly more, um, uh, you know, more that they have to respond to on those, given that they are court orders. Uh, they have not responded 79 times, but as you can see here, they have certainly been compliant a majority of the time. And, and unfortunately, they don't break this out by what all this is. So these could be primarily Alexa recordings, or they could be something totally different. We don't know. 
uh, because they don't disclose exactly what uh, these orders were for. Uh, they also have some other court orders, which can be just about anything. Uh, they also give you a range of national security requests because they're not allowed to, to tell you how many they get. Um, so we don't know what they did with those to a large degree. But check it out. If you're interested, you can see what Amazon has been turning over. They don't get a lot of these requests from one year to the next, but I'm sure in any instance where there's a crime committed and there's one of these things sitting in the room, they're probably going to want to look at it. I think, though, it's kind of crazy when you think about how far we've come or not as a society. If you had told anybody 20 years ago that you're going to have this device in your house that's always listening, uh, and is there to provide you with whatever you ask it for, I think people would have thought you were crazy. Like, who would want to put that in their house? But people do. And I got a Google one upstairs, and I got my phone listening all the time, too. And I guess we're all cool with it. But it's just kind of funny how uh, we, as consumers, have eroded our privacy as much as these companies have been doing, because we're willingly handing over all this information to Google, Facebook, and Amazon, and everybody else. And everybody's cool with it, because it provides convenience, I guess. But we have to think about our own behavior, too. And if you like commentary, this week's channel of the week will be one you want to check out. Uh, Rich at Review Tech USA. He does a lot of commentary videos and actually has been doing a lot more over the last couple of weeks. He hired an editor, so now he's cranking out more content than he's done in a while. Uh, great channel. Definitely check it out. He's got a lot of different topics that he covers, and I always enjoy listening to his opinions on them. And it's always kind of fun sometimes to watch the comment stream after he gives those opinions to see what other people have to say. Uh, but definitely check out Review Tech USA, and he's uh, cranking things out right now and doing a great job of it. So this week on the channel, we've got a couple of things that we'll be doing. Uh, I hope to get to this this week, which is the new single disc Synology device. This is, a, I think, the DS-119J. Uh, so it only has a single hard drive, but it only costs 100 bucks, and you get a lot of the Synology feature set. Uh, this will not work well as a transcoding Plex server, so we're not going to be spending too much time on that. Uh, but if you have like an NVIDIA Shield in your house and want to use that to watch Plex with this device, it might actually do okay if it doesn't have to transcode. So we'll talk about that uh, in the video, but we'll look at some of the other things you can do with one of these Synology NAS devices. They really do have, I think, the best software in the industry on these boxes, and it's great to see a low-cost one. Uh, we were going to do this last week, but then that uh, MacBook Air showed up, so we're going to be doing it this week, which is uh, the Mac Mini. In fact, I'll be getting some of my evaluation done on this uh, later this afternoon. And I also delayed it because I got a uh, AMD GPU. So we're going to try some eGPU stuff and compare its video editing performance with and without the GPU uh, and see where it goes from there. I ended up with the six core i7 version. And once I'm done getting everything evaluated, Corey's going to be using this as his new editing workstation, which I think might actually be faster than my iMac that I'm currently using. So uh, maybe we'll uh, get me one too later on. Uh, the other thing I want to do maybe this week or definitely early next week are my top 2018 products. I'm going to go through all the things I reviewed since my last top of the year video, which was back in December of 2017. And I'm going to give you probably, you know, 10 or 15 things that I think are really good. And I'd love to hear your thoughts as to what things you saw me review this year that you thought were among the best products of the year. And that is our Q&A for you this week. So leave those down in the comments below if you don't mind. And if I get through all of that, I'm going to start working on the Mr. Project. And if, again, if, if not this week, definitely uh, next week I'm going to get started on it because all of my parts are now in. I've got the whole stack now. And I want to start off with just the first component, which is the FPGA board, and see what you can do with nothing else on it, and then kind of build our way up with the other uh, components in a mister. Because you can really get going with this thing for about $180 or so, give or take. And this is really the future, I think, of emulation, is hardware simulation through an FPGA. Uh, there is a ton of stuff happening on this platform for both classic computers, but also classic game consoles. Uh, check out Smoke Monster's channel where he's been covering all the news with this, but it's been crazy how much stuff has been happening. Uh, in the last week, they've added a Super Nintendo uh, simulator. They've got a new processor core for all the 68,000 base computers and game consoles and arcade machines. This thing's just awesome, and I can't wait to get mine put together now that I've got some time, hopefully this week, to get to it. So stay tuned. We'll be talking more about it. Now, if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or one-time contribution. We also have our ongoing relationship with Plex. So if you sign up for a free Plex account, no credit card required, we get a small commission. We get a slightly larger commission if you sign up for a Plex pass or gift it to somebody else. 
it is the holiday season, so why not give a Plex Pass out, right? So you can go to that link down there and do just that. Our channels are uh, not only this one, but also my extras channel where I do unboxings and supplementary content. We have the podcast, which is the audio version of this show and the interviews that I do from time to time. We have the Snippets channel at lon.tv slash snippets for uh, short clips of this show by topic, so they're more search friendly. And then we have my live stream archive at lon.tv slash live streams. And if you like what I do, I do suggest you click on that subscription bell there so you get notified every time we post anything to the channel or go live. Uh, that is something you should definitely do if you don't want to miss anything. We also have my email list at lon.tv slash email. I send out occasional emails there, maybe once every couple of months or so. We also have the Facebook page at lon.tv slash Facebook, where a lot of this content ends up as well. Uh, we have the Facebook group, which is hovering close to 600 members now at lon.tv slash Facebook group, where you can uh, chat with other viewers and me. Uh, if you do sign up, there are some questions you have to answer. If you don't answer them, you don't get in. Uh, the reason why we have those questions there is to keep the spammers out. Spam on these Facebook groups is a pretty big problem, so we try to uh, alleviate that a bit by asking some questions before you join. So just fill those out and you'll get in. Uh, if you didn't get approved in the last week and had submitted, uh, resubmit because it might not, you may not have answered the questions. So that would be why you were declined by me or one of the other moderators there. Uh, and we have my store, by the way, at lon.tv slash store, where I sell things that I have previously reviewed here on the channel at a lower price than they cost new. Uh, so once we get the Latte Panda all packed up, it's going to be going up later this week, and we've got some other things that I've got to get to as well once I get a chance to clean up this uh, very messy office I'm currently working in. And if you want to get notified every time I add something to the store or change a price, you can sign up for a different email alert there. Lon.tv slash store alert will get you an email every time I add or change something on the store. And that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap-up. If you're in the United States or around the world and celebrate the holiday, enjoy your Thanksgiving. It's a great uh, time to get together with family and friends. And then some of you might go out shopping uh, the day after Thanksgiving. I will not be. My wife does. I stay home and play video games or perhaps work on more videos here for the channel. That might be a good time to start working on the Mister. So maybe we'll uh, do a little live stream as I start playing around with it. So stay tuned for that. Enjoy the holiday and we'll see you next week right here on the channel. And we've got a bunch more video reviews coming up this week as well. Thank you all once again for your continued comments and support. And until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Gerard Newberg, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.